Good people of YouTube, my name is Spanner. Welcome back to some more Death Gate. So, last time we read Balthazar's notes. It had a lot of, inf of information. Uh, most notably two spells and um, apparently this world uh, previously was ice. Not lava as it is now, but they built a colossus to heat up the world. It must have malfunctioned so somehow, it, now it's all lava. You decide that all the snake needs is a little affection. Perhaps that would change his disposition. You gather him up and pet him. He looks genuinely happy, just before he bites your head off. Okay, I'm not sure how the snake does that while he's uh, being grabbed. Okay, so wall. The far wall of the cave is covered with nine identical carved dwarven symbols. Uh, maybe this isn't a door, this is just the arrows pointing the way? Maybe I can use our new spell. Actually, uh, we'll use possession, but uh, what does ward do exactly? This powerful spell can only be cast by a group of talented sorcer sorcerers working together. It erects a shield which effectively repels all foreign magic, including magic, objects and creatures. Hmm... Yeah, and we can add to it. That's how bosses are created, the other spell. Yeah, but let's cast Possession. Let's possess the snake. You reach a hand toward the snake. Held by Jethro, the snake nonetheless manages to twist and lunge for you. You decide not to risk it. You walk toward the far wall of the cave. The snake rides and spits as it tries to escape the dead worker's grasp, but its efforts are futile. The corpse's grip is too strong and the dead nanny's constant repetition of the command to hold the snake keeps him from forgetting his task and wandering off. Soon you come upon the wall, a collection of nine stone circles, each with an ornate arrow carved upon it. If you click on an arrow, that arrow and all arrows immediately horizontally and vertically adjacent to that arrow will rotate clockwise. Click on reset to start over. If we sense that you are getting frustrated or are not making progress, then a hint button will appear on the interface. You will get a text hint the first time you click on hint. Clicking the hint button again will reset the puzzle, and then show you the first correct move. Further clicks will incrementally solve the puzzle. So do they have to point down? I kinda remember um, the nursery rhyme saying that. So let me just click a couple of them at random. Oh wait, this one is this is harder than I thought. I'm usually used to those, to those puzzles where instead of arrows there are lights, and if we uh, press a light, it will it will um, it will glow, and the adjacent ones will become dark. Uh, this has four different states, however, not two. All the ones on top are pointing downwards. I'm not even sure if I'm doing the, the correct thing, but...
Only the top row is missing. That's a shame. I'll just press a couple of them at random, see how it goes. One! are all together. Nope, doesn't quite do it. should get a hint or something. Oh, we don't have hints yet. Okay, this will be fun. Alright, here is a small hint. When you rotate one corner, also rotate the other three. When you move the circles on the sides between the corners, make sure you move all four. Only the center stone should be turned in independently. Oh, hold on. What? Yeah, move all four. This should be moved independently. Move all these four together. What? Okay, so one, two... I don't even know anymore. These points them all up. That does that. Now... I'm not sure if they all need to be pointing down. I think they do. Let's just let the game solve it for us. Oh. Okay, I was at least right about that. Yeah, I spent around uh, 10 minutes trying to solve that and nothing. So maybe we don't get any, any points for that. The stone symbols click into place and the wall slides away. Beyond, you see a dark tunnel. You steal yourself and walk in. These caves are ancient, carved long ago by the dwarf that lived here. Tunnels run off in all directions. Quite a few narrow twisting tunnels run off of this main cavern. Unlike this junction, the other tunnels are too small to follow very far. Not much problem for dwarves, but you're big even for a patron. Yeah, there's absolutely no way we can go th through any of these passages, so let's talk with the dead dwarf. Go away! I talked to no one. I wait for my lord. He will be here soon to take me with him. Be gone. 
The decomposing dwarf squints his good eye at you for a few minutes and then shakes his head so, violent, so violently that the near lobe falls off. He's waiting for his lords. So I guess his lord will have the um, the staff. Two tongs hold a black stone headpiece. Can I pry it off? Hmm, maybe cast a spell. Heat, maybe? Oh, but I'm casting it on the headpiece. Maybe I should cast it on the scepter itself. Yeah, it doesn't melt or even glow. The statue cle clearly represents a sartan, perhaps royalty. Given the crown and scepter he holds, the entire figure is made of wrought iron, save for the headpiece of the scepter, which is carved from a glossy black stone. Can I push the statue? No. A circular metal track runs through two doors on either side of the clock's face both inside and outside of the tower. Will the statue move? Eight bongs. The statue doesn't do anything. The doors automatically open at the stroke of the hour, but cannot be manually opened at any other time. Nothing to do with the statue. Firmly is held firmly by iron tongs and can't budge it by hand. Maybe I can't do anything yet. We've revealed the dwarf. Let's perhaps go to the next location. Cletus's palace. There's a cave, there's the palace. Let's check this cave. You take a few steps in, but the cave quickly branches into many tunnels. You become very confused, so you turn back. Never mind. Who are you? What are you doing here? You walk purpose purposefully towards the front entrance. The guards there stare at you in wonder, never having expected anyone to willingly walk into the palace. As soon as you approach, one of the guards barks out, Who are you? What are you doing here? You explain that you're trailing the refugees from Telestia. The guard knows, claims he doesn't know what you're talking about, but a knowing look to his companion leads you to believe otherwise. They inform you that all visitors must see the dynast. He makes his habit to greet them personally and hold a banquet in their honor. Again, the knowing look that passes between the guards is disquieting. With a grip that is more insistent than friendly, the first guard escorts you into the palace. You wait for about an hour in a bare room with a single door and no windows. 
Then the same guard takes you to a large room with a long table piled with food and drink. At the head of the table, a man wearing rich robes and a crown of gold sits in a throne-like chair. A broad, welcoming smile on his face. He invites you to sit and partake of this meal set out in your honor. For lack of a better plan, you sit down. Greetings, my friend. My name is Clytus the Fourteenth. I am the dynast of Abarak, and I rule here, but you probably know that. I'm always pleased to receive visitors. I get so very little. Please, tell me how things are in the Outer Reaches. So there are still people alive. Why do you get so few visitors? I'm not sure. My only guess is that people enjoy themselves so much where they live that they have neither the time nor the inclination to visit me. That is why I hunger so for information. I'm not your friend, Clytus. Such hostility. What have I done to deserve that? I say that I'm your friend. I merely wish to know how I can be of service to you. Are you a refugee? Are there others of you that require assistance? I'm no refugee. So, you don't represent anyone? You don't require assistance? Very well. You know, you look very different. Foreign. I've seen people from all over Abarak, and you look like none of them. Who are you? Where are you from? Wait, are you a Sartan? I came from Karn Telest. You know of it? Telest? You know, I think I've heard of that place recently. But I can't quite remember where. Where are my manners? You've probably been traveling for some time and are very hungry. I've been forcing you to converse while all of this food is laying here getting cold. You have my leave to partake. We will talk more later, I'm sure. I'd rather not if you don't mind. I'm not very hungry. Perhaps a toast would be appropriate. We must drink to our new relationship. I'm sure that we will grow to be exceptional friends. The Dionysus produces a bottle of red wine from the bar behind him and pours a single glass. He orders a dead servant to take the glass from his hand and place it before you. Please accept this special wine. I only bring it out for special occasions. I'm sure you'll find it to be... unique. He stares at you like a vulture, waiting for you to drink from the crystal glass. You notice that he is not holding a similar glass. I think I'll save this for later if it's all the same. It is not the same, my friend. You will drink that wine and you will do it now. I've lost all patience with you. He rises from the table and traces a spell in the air while you watch them found it. The blue rune shoots across the banquet table and explodes in your chest. You expect to feel some pain, but all you notice is an overwhelming hunger. You begin stuffing your mouth and pockets with food and drink. In spite of yourself, you snatch up the crystal goblet and drain the contents. Clytus smiles and sits back down satisfied. I know you, patron. Our books talk about your race. We believed them to be legends, but here we have proof. And if you are real, how many more of the other legends could be true? The other realms? The Death Gate? Abarak is dying. There's no way to save it, but you represent a way into new worlds, fresh lands to conquer. After you are dead, your corpse will tell me everything I wish to know. You will help me destroy your own people. Think on this as the poison eats through your body. Guards, remove this trash. Soldiers grab you roughly from the chair and drag you down long, winding corridors, Clytus's laughter echoing in your ears. You quickly lose track of the, road, of the route, your aching midsection demanding all of your attention. Soon you are thrown against a cold stone wall and shackles snap around your wrists. You slump to the floor as the guards stroll from the room, laughing at some private joke. You gather enough strength to look around the room. It's a stone cell. One wall has an open doorway, suggesting that ma manacles are what keep prisoners from escaping. A peg on the wall is home to a key on a ring, which looks like it might fit the lock on your shackles. It is, of course, out of reach. 
Another occupant of the cell is chained to the same wall and holds, that holds you prisoner. A thin crown, the crown along his brow att attracts your attention. This Sartan boy is some kind of royalty. Why is he confined to a dungeon is beyond you. The paleness of his skin, the occasional grunt and spasm, all lead you to believe that he has had his share of Clytus' poison as well. Edmund, there's a dog, a vise, there's the key. Hmm. I have some... Why do I have some steak? The steak is so rare, it's practically dripping blood. You can't identify what kind of animal it came from. You must have grabbed it from Clytus' banquet table when you were in the thrall of the hunger spell. So we also learned the spell. Hunger. Yeah, I figured that might be the case. He has a pendant. The prince's pendant is a miniature replica of the entire world seal. It has the naming runes for all four realms and the nexus. Ooh. Hello, my friend. It looks like we're both in the same boat. So much for relying on the hospitality of strangers. He ends his statement with a painful grimace and swift intake of breath. Who are you? My name is Edmund, and I'm the Crown Prince of Telestia. You couldn't tell I was royalty by the deluxe accommodations? Who are you? You're a prince? Why were you put in the dungeon? It's a long story. I come from Telestia, a city on the outer edges of Abarak. A few years ago, our water supplies started to dry up. Balthazar, the royal necromancer, studied the problem and discovered that the Colossus was failing. The magic that sustained us for thousands of years was ebbing. We knew that our time was limited. We boarded everyone onto our ships and set sail for the Fire Sea. None of us had been there before, but Balthazar's ancient maps indicated a route. The trip was perilous. What's more, our ships hadn't been used for thousands of years, since we first came to Telestia. By the time we arrived, we had lost many of our people, including the king, my father. Therefore, I became my people's leader. Our intended destination was this palace. We had never seen the palace, or met the dynast that ruled us. Instead of arriving on his doorstep with a few thousand refugees, I decided to leave them in a warren of natural caves that we discovered, and come here as an envoy. I thought that Clytus and I could speak and decide where my people could live. I arrived at the palace alone. He greeted me with open arms and invited me to a banquet. My people have been living on withered corn grass for months, so I must admit that a banquet sounded appetizing. During the meal, he began to question me. The questions were innocuous at first, but became more probing and less veiled as Clytus continued. He asked military questions. What was the size of our forces and where were the troops bivouacked? Suddenly, he was sounding less like a benevolent leader and more like a king bent on eliminating any threats to his power or strains on his kingdom's food supply. Just as I stood up and announced that I wished to take my leave, a sharp pain doubled me over. Clytus simply looked over and smiled. He explained that the wine in my cup had been poisoned and that after it killed me, he would drag the answers from my corpse. His guards brought me down here and locked me up. Now, I'm just waiting to die. How long have you been here? How long have you been here? Not long. Less than a day, surely. I fear that I can't hold out much longer, though. The poison has ravaged my system. It appears, for some reason, to be working faster on you. Perhaps you received a larger dose. I doubt that you have more than a couple hours left. What exactly is this Colossus? The Colossus is a stone spire infused with the magic of the ancients. It heats the world and slowly melts the Celestial Sea, a huge body of ice which feeds water throughout Abarak. For some reason, it is failing. Our water supply has dried up. It doesn't make any sense. According to Balthazar's books, the Colossus was designed to last forever. He hoped to examine the Colossus and perhaps help to mend it. But now we'll never get the chance. By ignoring the problem and focusing on his own petty self-interests, Clytus is sealing our world's doom. Where is the Colossus? The Colossus is in Clytus's palace. It lies at the center of the ancient catacombs which run through the palace's foundation. The entrance is right across from this dungeon. Although Balthazar's books state this, they don't show the path through the catacombs. It's said that only the Dynast knows the way. 
Where are your people now? They are safely tucked away in the secret caves along the edge of the Fire Sea. Clytus would give his eye teeth to know where. If somehow we managed to escape, we would still be stranded here with no way to cross the sea. I've got a ship. If you show me where they are, I could transport us there. The chances of escape are slim, but it's nice to know that we will have a way across the sea if we do. Why didn't you send some nobody as your envoy? Seems like a dangerous job for a prince. Everyone under my rule is important. There are no nobodies. I would risk myself before I would send someone else into danger. Can your people pose a threat to the dynast? They sound like a bunch of farmers. We are mostly peaceful folk, but we have some reserves of dead fighting troops. That doesn't matter much, though. While Clytus holds the scepter of rulership, he could turn my army into dust before it even got into position. Let's back up a step. The scepter of, ru of rulership, huh? Isn't Telestia quite a ways from here? Yes. It was a long, perilous journey which claimed my father. It's rather hard to accept that it was all for nothing. My name is Haplo. I'd shake your hand, but I'm kind of tied up right now. Very nice to meet you, Haplo. Any enemy of Clytus is a friend of mine. Let's talk about something else. All right. I don't have much else to do. Why do I feel so sick? That would be the poison. You've experienced Clytus' special welcome. It appears that he likes to invite strangers to a banquet, extract whatever information he can while pretending to be friendly, and then poison them. After they die, he resurrects the corpses to have them answer any remaining questions. Don't feel special. It happened to me as well. What happens if he decides he wants to keep his victim alive, or someone accidentally drinks the poison? Is it too late, or is there an antidote? There is an antidote, though it's unlikely we'll ever get our hands on it. I overheard some of the guards talking about it, when they were planning to sneak wine from the banquet room's bar. The bar contains a variety of liqueurs in a wide array of colors. As you're aware, the poisoned wine is in a red bottle. The antidote is in a clear bottle. It's useless to even think about it, though. Even if we could get out of these chains, we'd never make it past all the guards. Okay, clear bottle. Cool. Why did this Clytus lock us up? To give the poison time to kill us. When we're dead, he'll resurrect us and get all the information he needs. Why not just kill us? You know, with a sword or something. No way am I telling him anything, even after my death. <sighs> I'm afraid you'll have no choice. Part of the process of resurrection ensures that you'll serve the living to the full extent of your ability. You'll be glad to answer any questions he might have. Do you know any way out of here? In fact, I do. One of Balthazar's old books showed a secret passage out of the palace's foundation. If we were unfettered, I might be able to find that passage. What's Clytus' story? How'd he get to be dynast? That is a story. I only know the parts of the legend that Balthazar found in his reading. I guess we don't have anywhere to go, so I might as well tell you. According to the legend, our ancestors created this world and populated it with the weak races. Those races continually warred with each other, so our ancestors decided to sleep until everyone began to get along. Presumably, when that happened, our ancestors would wake and rejoin the new society. I guess they made Abarak a little too hostile for the weaker races. The heat and impure air were killing more of them than their petty wars were. So they banded together much sooner than anticipated and roused our ancestors. They arose to discover that the world was killing the races instead of nurturing them. They also found that there was nothing that they could do to save them. It required all of their magic just to keep themselves alive. So they selected a handful of members from each race, placed them in the sleep chambers from which they had just risen, and waited for something called the Interconnection. The books were a little unclear about this term. All they say is that it would make life much better on Abarak. Clytus I was a member of the High Council at that time. One day, he arrived in the Council session with a powerful magic scepter. With it, he convinced the others to found a monarchy, with himself as the dynast, the ruler. The line has continued unbroken, as far as I can tell, to this day. Each new son takes up the scepter of rulership and becomes the new dynast. The man who tossed us in this dungeon is Clytus the Fourteenth. It's said that his scepter can turn a man to dust in seconds. No one wants to confront such raw magic, so he remains in power. Clytus the First did do something right, though. 
He introduced us to necromancy. It's only by bringing back our dead that we have been able to stay alive. He even sacrificed his own personal servant as the first experiment. What happened to the rest of the weaker races? They died. There was no way to save them. It must have been horrible to watch them die, completely helpless to do anything. Sounds like he's the product of a little too much inbreeding. I know nothing about Clytus's specific lineage, but madness is a symptom of inbreeding, and he is certainly displaying that. Does the Council still exist? No. Clytus I disbanded it when he created the monarchy. My ancestor was a member. This amulet I wear was a badge of his office. It's been in my family ever since, and I wear it proudly. You really think necromancy is all that hot? It's hard to question something that is such a fundamental part of your life. But Balthazar has raised some interesting points. He believes that we should be concentrating on rediscovering the old, lost magic arts. If we used our magic to make our lives better, we wouldn't need to bring back the dead. To be totally honest, seeing my father resurrected into a shadow of his former self was chilling. I don't look forward to dying myself or to the inevitable result. If Clytus' scepter can turn a man to dust, why does he bother with poison? He still needs information from me. I assume the same is true for you. If he destroyed us, the information would be lost as well. If he kills us with poison, we are undamaged. Then he can resurrect us and demand the information he wants. Since the dead always serve the living, we'll have no choice but to tell him everything. You mean that if Clytus didn't have this scepter, he wouldn't be in charge? I would challenge him myself if I could count on a fair fight. My claim to the throne is as strong. My ancestor was also a member of the High Council. These are all pipe dreams, though. His scepter would make dust of them and me. What happened to his personal servant? Shortly after he rose to power, Clytus I sent him away. I believe he was banished to the ancestral home of the dwarves. In fact, it would have been in the caverns around Telestia. No one has explored that area in ages. I wonder if he's still there. That was an intriguing story, but let's talk about something else. All right. I don't have much else to do. Why is that dog watching us? Is he just waiting for us to die so he can chew on our bones? That's Clytus' personal hunting hound. The guards have orders to let him go anywhere he wants, so he has run of the palace. He's probably here because he's curious. They don't get many new visitors. I don't hold it against the hound that he belongs to Clytus. He seems nice enough. Until you came, he was my only company. He's a good listener. That's an interesting medallion you're wearing. Could I have it? I'm afraid not. It belonged to my ancestor and has been passed from father to son for centuries. I treasure it with my life. I'd like to rest now. I understand. I'm feeling sick and tired myself. I'm sure it's the poison, not the conversation. Okay, so that's a lot to take in. I think I, I have a pretty good idea of what to do here. I wonder, maybe we found the dwarf too soon? Maybe we'll act, we would actually find the combination, the correct number of steps to do the puzzle, maybe, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it doesn't matter. Anyways, um, it's uh, actually all the time we have for today, so uh, thank you guys for watching, hope you enjoyed some more Deathgate, and as usual, don't miss the next episode, because I won't. I will see you all next time.